Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Rev Left Radio. On today's episode, we have Seth and Jade from the Omaha Tenants United to talk about their struggles um, building tenant unions, their struggles against landlords, the role that tenant organizing plays in um, the revolutionary movement more broadly, its connections to anti-imperialist movements, uh, local organizations like the Jewish Voice for Peace and Nebraskans for Palestine working with OTU, the trials and tribulations, challenges and obstacles that um, these comrades have faced in their tenant organizing over the years, their biggest accomplishments, advice for people who want to begin their own tenant organizing campaigns in their own communities, and much, much more. It's, it's a really great conversation. Longtime listeners of RevLeft uh, will have heard episodes we've done with OTU over the years, um, but there's a lot of new developments that have happened since then in the broader environment, like housing costs, um, as well as the organization itself, which has been diligently continuing its, its amazing work in growing and learning this entire time. So it's a really great experience, uh, really great conversation with really principled and hardworking comrades. And as always, if you like what we do here at Rev Left Radio, you can join us on our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Rev Left Radio, where you get access to bonus monthly episodes, mostly me, um, you know, ranting and <laughs> doing my own analysis, reading articles, replying to YouTube videos, constructing arguments and having fun. It's just, it's, it's a cool outlet for me to be able to do things I'm not able to do on the public feed. And at this point, over seven years in, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of Patreon exclusive episodes in our back catalog that you could probably spend days going through if you are so inclined. And I also want to give a huge shout out to our friends over at leftwingbooks.net. Um, they have a cool agreement with us at Rev Left where they offer Rev Left listeners 15% off any book in their library. And they have an ever growing library with great works theory, history, memoirs, everything in between. Um, that is just a, a cool opportunity for me to bring the cost down for my listeners and support um, uh, uh, some comrades that are doing work in the very same spirit that we do here at Rev Left Radio. So I'll leave the uh, link in the show notes. And if you click that link, it'll automatically apply the code Rev Left at checkout, giving you 15% off any book in their library. All right, without further ado, here's my conversation with Seth and Jade from the Om- from Omaha Tenants United on tenant organizing and so much more. Enjoy. Uh, I'm Seth with and I'm an organizer with Omaha Tenants United. Oh, sorry. Okay, that's gonna have a longer one. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, okay. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. No, no, that's no, no, man, it can be long. Oh, it's totally fine. Oh uh, yeah, hey, my name's Jade. Um, I'm an organizer with Omaha Tennis United. Uh, I'm a small C communist uh, educator, gardener, mm, sports fan today. Go, go, big red. Nice. Yeah. Absolutely, the Huskers play today. Yeah. It's all we have out here in the lonely Midwest, <laughs> the Great Plains. Well, welcome, Jade and Seth. It's really cool to have you guys here. And unlike 99.9% of RevLeft episodes, which are done remotely over Zoom, we have you in shed. We literally, for those that don't know, record in a shed in my producer's backyard. <laughs> and that's where we are today. Um, but we're going to talk about uh, Omaha Tenants United. It's something that I'm sure longtime listeners of the show have heard crop up time and time again. I'm sure I've had you on in the past where we've mentioned it and talked about it to some extent. Uh, we've actually done two OTU episodes yeah, full, in the past, full episodes, very, right. way back in the day, I think. I yeah. want to say like 2019. Damn. Yeah. Time flies. <laughs> I feel like uh, I feel like probably half the people that like reach out to us online are like, oh, we heard about you in, in a Rev Left interview. I was like, that was like five years yeah, ago. We do people dig through this. the archives yeah. still. Yeah. Crazy. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. I mean, we're coming up on eight years in this spring, so um, old heads will know. But uh, for, for new listeners... Omaha Tenants United is obviously a longstanding organization here in the Omaha local area fighting for tenants' rights, but I don't need to introduce the organization. You guys can do that yourselves. So first and foremost, can you guys tell us a little bit about OTU, how and why it was founded, and and what its overall aim was and is? Um, Yeah, so we started sometime in 2018. Basically, at the time, a few of us were doing like a free food program sort of thing, Um, and, you know, we wanted that the goal of that was not to just simply be like a red charity, but to attempt to investigate 
um, you know, people's actual conditions and try to identify ways in which um, we could potentially find involve ourselves in other areas of class struggle and get people organized in. Um, well, we didn't always do the best job of that. Uh, one of the good things that did come out of it, you know, is when we were asking people questions was um, kind of repeatedly landlord issues, landlord issues. Um, and so a few of us just sort of decided decided to get a group off the ground specifically dedicated to that. Um, and so that was kind of the birth of Omaha Tenants United. Our first couple wins were actually people who were coming to those uh, free food giveaways. Um, our first one, for example, we had no clue what we were doing, to be <laughs> clear. Um, but uh, it was this guy who would come pretty much every month when we would do those distributions, and he had not had hot water in six months, basically. I think it was June or July when that was going, so he hadn't had it since, like, December. Um, and the landlord was just, like, telling him all this bullshit about how it wouldn't be worth it because they'd have to take out a whole wall to fix it, yada, yada, yada. Um, which is just nonsense. And, you know, regardless of how difficult it might be, <laughs> you have to provide hot water. That's your fucking job. Yeah, that's yeah. your job. Um, quote, unquote, job. <laughs> um, but uh, so we just, uh, we wrote a we wrote a demand letter, um, which, again, was pretty, we were kind of just figuring it out. And luckily, the landlord lived and had his office just a few blocks away from where I was living at the time. So um, we just literally showed up with the tenant and, like, five or six um, soon to be OTU organizers. I guess we didn't really have a name quite yet then. Um, and we tried to deliver it. He unfortunately was not home. So nothing really happened except for the fact that, uh, his neighbor took a bunch of pictures of us and, mm -hmm. um, sent them to the landlord and the landlord began like texting the tenant, cussing him out. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Bring all these random people over my place, blah, 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 blah. And the tenant sent him a picture of the demand letter. And then, all of a sudden, uh, the hot water was turned back on the next morning. It turned <laughs> out it was just a gasket that needed to be replaced wow. the entire time. So that took a whole five minutes to do. It was not um, taking out a wall. Um, so that was kind of our first victory. And I think we kind of just used that as a launching off point, you know, even though we didn't like directly engage with this landlord, um, you know, it showed us that um, confronting our class enemies works and can get results. And um, so we kind of just publicized that story um, to show that direct organizing is more effective than just repeatedly complaining to your landlord for months on end. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, that kind of just sort of started taking off from there. I guess the only other thing I'd add is after that, you know, since we obviously had no real social media platform to speak of, we just spent a lot of time basically doing cold calls. Like we would pick landlords that we knew were just, you know, notorious for being slumlords and we would just try to find as many of their buildings as we could and just knock on their doors and almost inevitably you'd find somebody with a problem that wanted to do something and we kind of just started picking off those little victories like that I guess and um, would publicize those stories to show that this does work and um, slowly and surely we had people reaching out to us to um, try to help them with their landlord issues and stuff. Nice. Jade? Yeah, um, I, so I joined, I think, a kind of few months after the story. So I mentioned I was in DSA at the time, still I'm in DSA, but um, we don't have a kind of local chapter here. So I was looking for something to do on the left when I moved to Omaha. Um, I'd been doing organizing in Lincoln for a few years, trying out some different sort of tenant things, but nothing really sticking as far as organizational-wise. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think throughout sort of like end of 2018, early 2019, we were figuring out like what like what it meant to be an organization, like what that sort of would look like. And um, doing a lot of that sort of like case work, solidarity work with individual tenants and experimenting with like what it would look like to do larger sort of collective actions. Um, so we expanded some of those like initial, you know, one tenant having a grievance to like, could we get a few people to sign on to this? And those were sort of the beginnings of our like um, move into a more like collective approach to tenants fighting back. Um, inspired, I think, along the time by a lot of other uh, tenant organizers across the country trying to use those same tactics. Um, and that, I think, brought us to, like, 2020, this moment where I feel like everybody briefly got into tenant organizing or the idea of it, right? We had this sort of, like, rent strike idea that I think um, very much swept into the national consciousness. Um, and, well, like, obviously, a national rent strike didn't happen. I think the vestiges of most of the tenant organizations that we see today came out of that moment. Um, so I just wanted to kind of connect those things. And briefly, what was it about 2020 that gave rise to... 
Was it was it just the COVID situation, the political environment more broadly, people being in their homes, the housing crisis in the sense of like home prices hasn't quite happened yet that we're living in today? I don't know. Yeah, that's a really good question. I feel like we have not really sat down to think through the actual sort of like, because I would love to sequence it out and see like yeah. if we could detect a sort of trend of things. There very much was like a, you know, like kind of. I remember we like did some media first of April. We actually had an event like a car parade uh, first of April, or was it the I think first of May. Maybe? First of May. Yeah, first of May. Yeah, yeah. For that. sort of drawing attention yeah. to, like the fact that people couldn't pay their rent if they'd been unemployed um, mm. and had started already burned through their savings. Um, so I think that was a lot of it. There was the other piece of it is that like for a very brief period of time, tenants had legitimate protections against landlords in a way that they have now lost again. Right. Um, and with the sort of local. Of yeah, yeah. Uh, um, eviction, moratoriums on evictions were the biggest one. Right, right. And that gave people a ton of room to organize that they do not have now in most places. Yeah, it's always kind of fascinating to look back over the political terrain, even of the last five to ten years, and things do get memory hold so quick. There's like these <laughs> yeah. uh, these like these uh, immense moments of blossoming that then close again, and we just kind of move on. Um, you know, climate change is a different as another example, because I remember I think it was that summer, maybe it was the next one, where there was those pictures of the red sky with the UPS truck and, you know, the Mm -hmm. fires everywhere. And there's a lot of momentum building up about climate. I think at some point climate was even like in the top one to two issues of the American people for a brief moment because of those stark images. And then, you know, the climate sort of changes. You go into winter and things kind of die down. and And we do kind of forget these little, so many of them happen, these little sparks. And I think those sparks are inevitably leading somewhere and we're not quite there yet and we'll see, but... Um, I, I forgot. About, yeah, I sort of memory hold the entire <laughs> eviction moratorium situation. But even just mm-hmm. giving uh, tenants a little bit of leverage like that, you know, can can spark further action um, in a way that just the total deprivation of 2024 seems to, you know, hinder in certain ways. So, one thing I would just like say on that quickly, though, is even though that you know was a concession from the state, I guess two things. First of all, that was a very paper thin one. Um, Always is not particularly well enforced or made uh, <laughs> made known to people in any sort of systematic fashion because, I mean, a lot of our organizers spent a great deal of time down at the courthouse simply passing out the moratorium to people because if you didn't have it on, you can probably explain that better than I can, yeah. but I, my understanding is like if you don't, if you didn't have that going into it and declared it, they could just go ahead and evict you anyway. Yeah, much. I mean, this is generally how the courts work here in Nebraska is that like t- uh, judges are not in any way on tenants' side in so far as like they don't even make tenants aware of any defense that they could possibly use in court. And like tenants are not really able to represent themselves. Um, mm-hmm. And there's very few uh, lawyers that are representing tenants. There is uh, some decent work done by like volunteers in at least Douglas County and in uh, Lancaster County and Lincoln. Uh, through this tenant assistant project where there's people kind of giving their time uh, sort of pro bono volunteering. Mm. Um, But that's largely been for, like, there's income requirements for most of the stuff they're doing. Um, And generally they're just trying to buy people time to make a deal with the landlord either to, like, catch up on their rent or to move out a few months later. So, Mm. the fact you know, sort of the same result at the end of the day. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. And I I think I do remember after the eviction moratorium officially ended or whatever, there was this whole wave of – backlash from the landlords charging back rent when it ended like you know now you owe me for those months now and the moratorium is over Mm -hmm. and and i i remember even during the time um my i had a a close friend that got covid got fired couldn't make rent got evicted and i remember you know fully masking up going over helping him move his stuff out of this house during eviction and I even asked Rev left listeners at the time to help him find a place he's going to be homeless Mm -hmm. and so i totally you know understand the the huge holes even in uh, ostensibly um you know nice program like that for as long as it lasted but yeah and i mean this is oversimplifying the sort of result of it but um the main way that like landlords were made whole was through these like um stimul i I don't know what the proper like people were given money to pay their back rent to sort of rental Mm. assistance rental assistance Mm. was given to the states and the states then sort of disperse them in these very messy fashions but effectively, that was just paying off landlords. Like, it was a huge yeah. transfer of money back to the <laughs> landlords. It was never anything to, like, help tenants in the long run. Well, and not only that, a bunch of landlords straight up won't accept it, which, yes. like, makes, like, no financial sense, obviously. Yeah. But there's I, I, there, there's some sort of psychology there, obviously. Like, I mean, they're so obsessed with just, like, enforcing um, 
just their dominance over mm-hmm. people that, the, you know, they won't even accept money from <laughs> elsewhere on, like, your behalf. It's crazy. Uh, and that, I mean, that's exceedingly common. I mean, yeah. we've had a ton of tenants reach out about that. Unfortunately, there's, uh, you know, just the way that we operate, we don't have a ton of great ways to address those. But um, it's a super common problem. Um, yeah. All right. Well, that leads actually into this next question, which is about, you know, how things have changed since then. And one of the big ways that have changed, and this is happening in some ways across the the quote unquote West or the Imperial core, but definitely in the United States and North America more broadly, is this untenable, you know, crisis in the cost of housing. And it, it puts anybody in a bad position. It obliterates the ability for people to buy a home, which for many Americans is the only way that they could reliably build wealth over the, the span of their lifetime. Um, and ov- obviously it also dictates rent costs. And I've seen my rent go up. Um, I've seen everybody that I've known rent go up. In some places rent has doubled, tripled. Um, how has that hit this local area? And, and what has that done to, I mean, for your organization, but more broadly for, for tenants in general? How has it impacted them? Yeah, we. I mean, so the biggest sort of anecdotal thing we've seen is it's very much changed what how tenants in Omaha respond to poor conditions. I think like the sort of early days of 2018, 2018, tenants who like had a stable job and a little bit of money saved up, if they were having issues in their apartment, they would move mm. because you could find a place that was similar, you know, part of town or maybe a nicer part of town. Rent would be about the same, maybe a little bit more, maybe it'd be a nicer place. That no longer really seems to be a viable option for most tenants. So it's been, I think, in some ways sort of nice for our organizing because we've seen a lot more tenants wanting to stay and fight here in Omaha mm. um, and fight to sort of, you know, make their conditions better. Um, and we've also, I think, seen, again, I don't know, but, like, I think the sort of consolidation of housing by, like, private capital um, mm. has led to a lot more, like, neglect in, like, quote-unquote, nicer tenants, uh, tenancy. Um, like, so... We're getting a lot more tenants, I think, reaching out, not just from, like, the sort of cheapest slumlords in the city, but also from these sort of, like, corporate landlords who uh, have just been completely neglectful of, like, the actual job of being a landlord, you mm. know, quote-unquote job again, but, like, uh, not making repairs at all. Like, you know, having a maintenance guy maybe there once a week or if ever, you know, um, cutting costs wherever they can, basically. Exactly. Yeah, and I think that... Uh to goes a long ways towards like reminding some like you know relatively better off workers you know who may sort of be in that like middle range but you know they're not like destitute um reminding where their place in society is um because your landlord doesn't give a shit like if yeah. you know you you went to college and uh you know you you might have a cubicle job or something like um they're increasingly, you know, not even keeping up appearances there. And I think that also drives kind of, um, you know, like Jade said, we're not just operating within, like, you drive past a building and it's clearly a slum type of thing. I think whereas, like, our very early organizing, that's quite literally how we did it because that's how we found cases. Um, you know, it is coming from places where you wouldn't necessarily expect, you know, that, like, for lack of a better term, I guess, in, like, the popular imagination, kind of, like, middle class lower Mm. middle class um and so i think you know i'm hopeful that would uh kind of get some of those people to see what side they should really be on um because there's obviously a lot of um a lot of those types can be very aspirational bourgeoisie Mm -hmm. people that Mm -hmm. uh you know don't see themselves like the others because they have some degree of extra privilege compared to what you would like, you know, typically think of as being like a very like poor working class person. Um, but in addition to that, I think the other way in which the landscape has changed a bit too is um, just, I mean, last time we were on like gentrification in Omaha was already a huge problem, but that's all, that's just accelerated and the developers have really like consolidated their gains there and kind of what you're seeing is more and more so many of the awful like housing um that we see is being pushed farther and farther west in the city mm. whereas like um i guess for listeners like um you know west omaha is generally considered you know the sort of the suburbs not quite but you know a little bit more 
affluent than mm-hmm. um, like the eastern part of the city, and that's certainly been the case historically. Definitely. Um, but now, you know, because um, of gentrification, um, we're seeing you know these neighborhood revitalization projects um, and stuff that these developers come in and produce this you know like nice housing that's insanely unaffordable and not that nice but what that results in is more more lower income workers being pushed farther west like the number of just like awful places like west of 100th street Mm -hmm. is pretty crazy and i feel like that's grown significantly because i don't know that like for the first couple years there i mean i'm sure it was a thing to some degree then but i can't think of a time where we were really like organizing anywhere west of like i don't know it's 72nd yeah. street yeah. basically yeah. and it seems like it's become more systematically pushed west as they bring um higher income people more into the city center um displacing mm-hmm. uh lower income people now there's like kind of a reversal of that like suburbanization process um that's pretty interesting uh, i was gonna say really quick that that does speak to to my understanding born and raised here you know 35 years in omaha there was always growing up west omaha yeah even like my stepdad would talk about west of 72nd and east of 72nd as two yeah. distinct <laughs> mm-hmm. sort of types of, of omaha's and you know on the on the east of 72nd you have north omaha traditionally the black community this is a very still uh, sort of de facto segregated society uh, yeah. city and then East Omaha is like, you know, the downtown area, and that's obviously sort of urban and it has all those sort of, you know, features. And then South Omaha is traditionally like sort of poor European immigrants, a lot of like, you know, Polish, you know, Eastern European type of culture. And then now it's obviously like, you know, Mexican and Latino and South American immigration for over my lifetime. You know, that's where I grew up in South Omaha. But I, I have seen the deterioration creeping westward where yeah like even neighborhoods that in millard for example millard used to be sort of a solidly middle class place and you can see neighborhood after neighborhood being run down as the overall downward pressure on everyone has continued so everybody is being pushed down and down and down and and so it is very interesting to see to see that impact that sort of idea of west omaha which has really changed in our lifetime and really over the last 10 15 years especially and then to Jade's point about private equity, you know, it, th- their whole job is to come in and, and cut costs to increase profits. And so they buy up all these single family homes as part of these investment packages and portfolios. Um, they 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 are not they're not wanting to do be the job of a corporate landlord. They do that. But in everything that they do, everything that they buy, their whole modus operandi is to cut costs by any means to 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 bolster profits by any means and so that's going to come at the cost of tenants and you know there's very little you can do or you feel like you can do in the face of that and they've even had internal memos released where these private equity companies talk very openly and explicitly about america becoming a country of renters there's no longer a a tradition of owning your home and so we got to corner this market we have to dominate this and there's even already been big big landlord price fixing schemes that have been uncovered where these huge uh, corporate landlords come together to fix to fix rents and, and keep them artificially high, uh, again, to generate profit and brutally exploit renters. So that's a, that's a huge piece of the puzzle when it comes to the skyrocketing home cost. And if there is anything like a solution, it's going to come at the total dismantling of private equity's hand in the housing market. Yeah, and that's, I think, an important point to point out to, like, tenants and tenant organizers is that, like, your landlords are highly organized. Like, I mean, the mm-hmm. rent cartel thing that you mentioned, uh, yeah. they're they're in lockstep with one another. Obviously, there's competing interests to a degree, as there always is in capitalism, but uh, they have, you know, their areas of um, intense organization. Even here in Omaha, you know, we have the Mopoa, it's yeah. Metropolitan Omaha Property Owners Association. Is yeah. their little like landowners club? Yeah, we've been in there a couple times where they try yeah. to like red bait us and <laughs> stuff, but like mm-hmm. what, they can't red bait you if you're like <laughs> already deep red. calling yourself. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I mean, that's a and I think that's a good point to always try to drive home to people to um, when we're attempting to organize them because I think a lot of people still have in their heads that. You know, even when they are renting from a corporate landlord, that this is 
whether that's just expressed in like the office manager, they see it as like the singular like sort of issue that's between them and like this one person who either, you know, is stumbling their way along or does really suck. But, you know, these can be resolved through just like individual, Mm -hmm. I guess, struggle. Um, And, you know, if it's not, I'll just leave and go shop around elsewhere, which like Jade pointed out is becoming increasingly difficult to do. Um, But uh, I think it's, just really important to point out how class conscious landlords are and how organized they are and that the only way to really combat that and have any effective means of uh, changing things and um, tipping the balance of power is for tenants to also be highly organized because they're operating on a level that's several steps ahead of Mm -hmm. where the people they're renting to are. Yeah, and I want to talk a second about like what that organization looks like. Um, sure. So we were we recently got like a cease and desist from a landlord lawyer about a <laughs> meeting that we were having um, at a site, and so we sort of just were looking into this guy, and he spoke at the uh, most recent Mopoa meeting, like right before he had sent us this letter, and then we're like looking through their upcoming events, and they've got a fundraiser going on uh, last month at the uh, Tackle eighty eight, like the Nazi gun range mm, here. Yeah. Which, I don't know. If I don't, I, it's I a whole thing. Yeah, they're they're also that. like really plugged into the Bolsonaro regime, <laughs> yes. uh, ironically, which is, weird, which is another great evidence. Yeah, like, yeah, these yeah, people yeah. are like the, uh, the capitalist class is organized yes. across international Absolutely. borders. Uh, you know, like we laugh at that, but I mean, that's only a small and uh, relatively, I mean, benign, like in the grand scheme of things, example of just how. Uh, these people are organized every which way possible. So, yeah. Yeah. so this is a global fashion thing. So the fundraiser, though, was just really quickly, was for the um, police uh, oh, yeah. union, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're, you know, hand yeah. in hand, knowing who their their friends are. Absolutely. Yeah, and that, that's called a Tactical 88. If you if you Google it, I'm sure things will come up. Um, yeah. Their history of reactionary politics and their weird anti... They had anti-Islam speakers come in. They trained the local police. Um, there was even that... that a kerfuffle if you will about the 88 yeah, <laughs> on yeah. the name yeah. like what does that represent and like the just the, the iconography of the place i don't know definitely worth looking in a lot my, of eagles yeah exactly yeah, a lot of eagles. my most reactionary family member is a member of tactical 88 so um, there you go. a distant a distant <laughs> uncle so <laughs> look it up but um but yeah the, another thing just really quickly that we were talking about a little bit is back in the day when you used to be able to move you you had some leverage and like if this was so shitty i could just go somewhere else and with the rise of housing costs, sometimes, as is the case with me and my family, we're grandfathered into a better rent rate, but it's also a locking you in because, you know, I'm in a situation where my landlord is just like one, it's, a, it's this old man and his wife, and they're decent people, and they just have a couple properties, whatever. It's like, you know, out of all the possible scenarios, it's it's not a terrible one. Um, but, you know, if he turned one way or the other or just stopped doing it or whatever, got older and less capable of coming over and fixing things we would be really fucking screwed because the attempt to move anywhere would o- almost immediately mean a 300 500 600 800 dollar increase uh, in our rent and so you totally lack that leverage and when you lack that that leverage you're much more exploitable and you know don't fool yourself to think that the landlords don't consciously know that um but the next question i have is sort of zooming out um, what role does tenant organizing play in the broader revolutionary movement in the U.S. today? Obviously, you're both communists, and so this is not merely something you do locally, but you have vision of a of a whole different you know society. We all do. Um, so, if you could talk about that and and why it's an important and relevant sphere of struggle, because some of the most, in my opinion, some of the the more advanced organizational formations in the United States right now are you know, disproportionately focusing on, on an issue like this, on tenant organizing. So, yeah, do you have any thoughts about the role that it plays within the broader movement? Um, could I just provide a couple practical examples and then, mm-hmm. um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I guess, uh, I, first of all, I mean, you know, organizing as landlords has always been very appealing to me because um, I'm a Maoist. So there's I'm grandfathered <laughs> in as far as hating <laughs> landlords goes, but no, I joke. Um, but no, I, you know, I see it as a, like a site of struggle that hasn't been co-opted by like institutionalized or like yellow unions for the mm-hmm. most part. Um, so it is a space in which um, we have a lot of room to operate because people simply here in Omaha aren't, doing it um and you know and that, and that goes i guess for america more broadly for the most part there's not like you know you don't have like a 
teamsters of tenants, basically. Right. So I think it provides um, revolutionary organizers a way to engage in class struggle pretty unencumbered compared to like trying to go into a workplace or in, you know, maybe trying to reform a union or whatever. There's a lot more and, you know, we can speak to like the practicality or worthwhile of that later maybe. But um, r- regardless, it, it, that does mean that is more of an uphill battle no matter like what side of the debate on that you take. Um, so I think like the tenant landlord struggle provides us with a really unique circumstance in which um, there's nothing really going on there. Um, and by just showing people that if they fight, they can win um, is really powerful and um, gives us a lot of great opportunities to do that and show people that class struggle works um, and really like draw a dividing line of like who are your friends and who are your enemies. Um, mm. Cause you know, like I mentioned earlier, like I think a lot of, tenants at first do kind of just view landlords as sort of this like benign person that they just kind of give money to and they're expected to hold up their end of the bargain and then of course that doesn't that that doesn't always happen and increasingly doesn't happen um and so i think it provides a lot of great opportunities to show people um just how exploitative this relationship is um and you see that in landlords reaction once tenants start getting organized too like it becomes very clear that they are not like your buddy or like this nice guy that um you know just makes repairs for you every once Mm -hmm. in a while like when push comes to shove uh, they will shove um and so i think you know that broadly speaking too i think it's easy to sort of expand on that because um as i think i'm probably just recycling what i said on a previous episode but like you know the tenant landlord relationship is just like a very like bare-faced capitalist one like you're you're giving somebody money to just do nothing Mm -hmm. like for you to exist in a space and i think when you kind of put it in those like bare bones terms um that's that becomes very obvious to people and i think it provides opportunities to hopefully um expand on that to you know other areas of our lives such as our workplace but but i think even just simply the process of engaging in class struggle um you know daring to struggle and daring to win is something that can be transformative for people both for organizers and for the tenants involved um and that you know preps them to be more willing to fight um in other areas as mm-hmm. well so i think in that sense um it has a lot of utility there um but i think like also, you know, just a couple practical ways, you know, here in Omaha, like, for example, um, a few of us do like a little Marxist study group each Saturday. Um, and one of the lead tenants who originally reached out to us, um, and we'll get a bit more into this later, I'm sure, about uh, Fontanelle Hills building, which we eventually established as Nebraska's first tenants union. Mm-hmm. You know, they're now coming to Marxist study group. Um, another nice. building that we unionized recently um, one of the tenant captains theirs just came to her first one this morning as well. Amazing. And granted, you know, those people already had like communist sympathies, but, um, just with the way that like society is set up, it's so easy to just be completely atomized and not even be aware that you're not the only person like you yeah. in a given area. Or if uh, you are, the only way that you sort of metabolize that is through the alienation of being on the computer. Yeah, and so you can have the outlet, the cathartic release of going into forums and seeing other people bitching, but there's no nothing can actually happen. And I think that's ideologically, it serves obviously the interest of the status quo because it sort of gives you that cathartic release as if you're in it with other people, but fundamentally keeps you just at your computer, not doing anything locally. And so you know you get the cathartic release without any of the actual threat to power. Yeah, exactly. And so I think it, you know, it can serve as an opportunity to, um, you know, consolidate forces and bring people in who maybe have similar political sympathies, but don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it's great in that way. And then um, also, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I just think there's a ton of different ways that you can connect the tenant struggle to various other issues. And um, one thing we're working on now is like we're collaborating with uh, Nebraskans for Palestine and Jewish Voices for Peace to do a study group of um, of uh, a strategy for the liberation of Palestine by the PFLP. Mm. Um, 
And, you know, while it seems like, you know, on the surface, none of these orgs, you know, they're pretty specific orgs, right? Mm -hmm. But um, those, those, those type of relationships, whether that, whether that be like a colonial one or a landlord one or, you know, any, any sort of exploitative class relationship, um, they share, they share that fundamental thing in common. And, um, and I think there's a lot of interesting ways you can relate the tenant struggle back to a lot of these issues and so that like that's one like practical example of where we're really trying to like bring other orgs together and try to identify um, areas of solidarity to hopefully grow a more powerful um, anti-imperialist movement more mm. broadly that goes beyond just like the direct um, tenant organizing stuff. And that's not unique to tenant organizing, to be clear. You know, obviously any types of orgs can do that. But I think um, that's just like one of the opportunities that it's afforded us and I, I really look forward to seeing where those things go absolutely Jade. yeah no i um agree with all of that i have to add in the like proletarian disorganization piece um mm. people should read our moment uh proletarian disorganization as the problem of our time uh if they want to know more about like what i mean by that term but very simply like um the vast majority of people in the united states are not organized in any sort of meaningful way not organized even into uh like churches or boy scout troops like the level of organization in civil society has even decreased within my lifetime yes. and if we would like to have a revolution someday we need to give people a place to become revolutionaries and to live out a politics that directly challenges capital and there is no way that, at least I found in the tenant rights I've been doing, to like bring people together in a way that does not bring them in conflict with their class enemies. Like mm-hmm. there's no third way of, you know, we're going to get our city council to give us rights. That's not, you know, our city council is made up of entirely landlords. Yeah. Um, they, you know, will go on the news every year and say, oh, we got to really do something about these horrible conditions. Um, and nothing has happened. Uh, and probably nothing will happen until we have a organized tenant movement that is demanding um, and has the power to, to make those demands. Um, and not be able to refuse them. Um, and like, even while we're connecting with tenants, like in the organization we're doing, we find that there are like pockets of organization and like community, right? Like the working class builds cells for self-defense. Um, but those pockets are disconnected until we like create the structure to, to connect them through the mm-hmm. tenant union. And like, um, generally we find that like most people, what I said a second ago, like most people not being organized matches up very closely with what we've seen. So like there might be a random union member um, in a, you know, te- like, uh, building that we're organizing, but they don't think of themselves as like being able to use their union to improve their conditions at home. Um, mm. And I think vice versa. We hope that the opposite happens too, right? Like people start to organize with their neighbors and they realize that they've now been given a method to fight back against exploitation. Mm-hmm. They can bring that method into the workplace or whatever other place they're facing oppression. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just really quickly going off what you said, uh, um, I just think just a couple like brief examples of seeing like those small like progress and consciousness happen is like me and Jade were both just at a tenant mass meeting a couple of nights ago. Um, and, and there's one guy that brought up, well, can we bring, can we get our, our city council person involved? Like, could we bring them to one of these mm-hmm. meetings and yeah, use their clout for us? Yeah. yeah. And he's an old Navy guy. He's cool. He's cool. Yeah. You, know, you know, he obviously has like some very clear, like class hangups and both like how politics is like to be, conducted um naive but understandable right and uh you know we kind of like pushed back on that but then you know another tenant uh (laughs) you know immediately started like going and they're all bought and paid for like uh you know and she was really killing it and you know we kind of patiently explained to him like hey you know that might be like a interesting pressure point just to Mm -hmm. like make other people's lives harder to make (laughs) this work but you know bringing them in here would be a potential liability because of how like closely related they are to the landlords. We provide a couple Absolutely. examples of that. And, you know, it's not like he walked out of there with a red guards uniform on, but mm-hmm. like, you know, you could see like, <laughs> like he's like, okay. Yeah. Like you could yeah. just like, see like there's like a greater level of understanding. He didn't like push back. And like, it, it was clear that he could understand why inviting a city council <laughs> member to a right. union meeting might not be like the best idea. Right. Um, so I think that's cool. And like to Jade's point too, about like, Um, you know, just people becoming more organized and stuff. And also just like, you know, creating community because half the battle is honestly doing that because most people don't talk to their neighbors at Mm -hmm. all, which is crazy. Um, but there is like one lady there that volunteered to be a tenant captain for the union. And, but she mentioned like, I'm, I'm worried about knocking on my neighbor's doors because they're all kind of just 
not nice people mm. and blah, blah, blah. And then another lady raised her hand. It turns out she was in the exact same building. It was her neighbor. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, but she also volunteered to be a tenant captain. And so, like, they mm. immediately, like, you know, nice. got to talk to each other a little bit. It was like, oh, you know, like. Break down some of those walls. Yeah. And, you know, and even just in, like, those small, like, little ways. Like, I'm not going to, like, suggest that we transformed people too much right then and there. But like, you know, like I think even just like breaking down one's preconceived notions about who they're living next to. And now they're going to be working very closely together, organizing their union with one another. Um, I think that goes a long ways to towards combating like the disorganization problem and stuff. Yeah. Then the neighbor thing is, is sad. Like I have, I have neighbors that, you know, and like the ones right next to me, I've done things for them that, you know, has built a sort of relationship over the years um, you know, watching their house when they go out of town or vice versa or clearing, you know, trees fall down or one of my neighbors are they're sort of like disabled and their dog got out. So, you know, I helped them go, you know, spent like an hour running around the neighborhood getting their dog for them. And those sort of build nice relationships. But there's others that you can just feel that like total alienation that I've lived next to you, you, you know, for years. And I don't I never barely even see your face. There's there's new couple. They're about our same age. You know, me and my wife, same age. They have kids about our same age. It's like a perfect opportunity to do, at least try to make some connection. And no matter if I'm driving by or he's driving by and I'm in my driveway or I'm walking past his house, like on one of my little walks or something, I'm always trying to catch his eye to wave and just, you know, and he just will, he will go out of his way to look away, to make sure that he is, pretends like he doesn't see me, you know, to keep, and I was like, I don't know if maybe it's like a personality thing where he's just more introverted and shy. Um, <laughs> am I an intimidating guy? I don't think so. And so, but it just kind of breaks my heart. It's like, we have every reason to at least have a human connection. And I don't understand that lack of human connection. And historically, it would be anathema to live in the same community, the same neighborhood, two houses away from another human being and another family for years on end and not even know their names. And I think that's just like a speaks to the broader or alienation of, of modern society. But I did want to make a couple points. Jade made a great point about civic associations and how those have you know deteriorated over time, how they're essential I mean, in, in all communist societies that have been successful, there has been this expansion into the civil realm where there are these free-floating organizations. And even in the U.S., post-World War II, you had things like, I remember my grandma was in the Lions Club. That's a, that's a callback. <laughs> my dad and, was in that. Yeah, <laughs> see? And it's, it's weird and it's not political by any means, but it's just like regular people coming together to do something routinely. Um, union culture played that role for a lot of people and still, I think, does. You know, there's that big union sta- fire union station off 72nd Street here in Omaha, and I've had m- family and friends that have been in unions, and they hold these community events there all the time. And it's like a wonderful little thing that you could that you could have community and, and you foster that solidarity. Um, and so wherever those exist, you got to keep, you know, perpetuating them. And I think a tenant union is obviously getting neighbors together, <laughs> struggling for a common goal is one way that you can kind of, you know, revive that element of society, which is essential for functioning democracy, which, of course, we also don't have. Uh, another a stat that came up uh, recently that I saw is the the average U.S. renter pays $330,000 in rent before purchasing their first home on average. <laughs> and now, you know, many people never end up purchasing their first home, so that number goes up your whole life. You spend a million dollars on housing that you have no equity in. And it's just like the, the, the raw injustice of that is just so clearly obvious. You've literally paid for it with your labor, your time, and your money over decades and decades and decades, and you don't own a fucking square inch of that place. And I, you know, it's just absolutely, um, grotesque, but yeah, I mean, homeowners also benefit from one of the rights that very few tenants have, which is they effectively have rent control for 30 mm. years, right? Like a mortgage is just rent control. You mm. build some equity as well, but you are guaranteed that this is we, what you're yeah. going to pay. Maybe your taxes go up a little bit. Right. But like, yeah, you are safe from the sort of pressures of the market for the most part. It's a good point. In that sense. Yeah. Like locked in mortgage rates. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, yeah, so that's, well, that's even weird. that's like even that's becoming increasingly predatory too. Is like yeah. the, as the like capitalist class needs to rope people into being able to buy homes with you know with the interest rate situation that we're in. Mm-hmm. Like because I saw like Rocket Mortgage is it was gonna they had a program where you can put as little as one percent down, mm-hmm. which is just so insane and like very predatory. Like and you're just setting yourself up for a a horrible crisis mm. they're not being the charitable by offering you 1% no no that is not yeah <laughs> that's the doorway yeah. to get fucked yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh 
Um, all right, well, you mentioned the Fontenelle Hills thing, and that's a relatively recent development, so that would never have been brought up on previous um, OTU episodes, and that's also expanding your reach into Bellevue, which is you know one of these orbiting minor cities, but this is all part of the bigger metro, of course. Um, so with that in mind, can you talk about that, and also what have been some of the biggest accomplishments or successes of OTU thus far? Yeah, um, I guess we can just kind of start in with a timeline of that and where mm-hmm. we are. Um, yeah, so uh, a tenant at Fontenelle Hills reached out to us about a ton of problems that they are having with um, the landlord. Um, just, you know, the place is just in disarray, um, just not being maintained. And these are cool places that they would be if, you know, the landlord put in least bit of effort the the company is called elevate they're actually based in minnesota but they own a bunch of properties here and, and elsewhere throughout just, the Midwest. just to be clear final hills is just a, a big apartment complex yeah, yeah. it's yeah. um about 300 units okay, okay. it's okay. 31 buildings. and elevate is the corporate landlord yes, yes. Okay. yeah mm-hmm. um so uh they reached out and um we kind of just started by canvassing a few of the buildings i think we started with like four or five um but very quickly from that we were able to get a sense of the main issues going on. Um, I mean, just kind of everything under the sun, you know, the landlord, not, not really having a repair system in place at all. You know, they're now the tenants were told they had to like call this hotline to submit repairs now, but then it's kind of just like this endless, like call forwarding thing until you can finally leave a message that never goes answered. So there's like no longer like a formal, like, ticket submission thing or there Mm -hmm. is but they kind of just get completed and then you get told you gotta completed without anything actually being done and then you get told you gotta like call this number that goes to nowhere yeah 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 there's also the issue of (laughs) um, elevate would when it's time to renew your lease like you know they'd send you your lease documents and whatnot you sign it send it back they don't sign and send it back (laughs) and so you automatically get transferred to a month to month lease mm. which is obviously more money is i i don't know how much more i want to say like a hundred dollars a month more Feels probably more right, yeah. Yeah. yeah and so tenants are obviously not paying that because they're under the assumption that oh they're gonna get back to me and it's like it's whatever they keep paying their regular rate but then they start getting charged late fees My God. on for not paying the increased rent all because elevate didn't countersign the fucking lease straight up crime yeah. yeah and then they issue eviction notices based on that oh too my God. um so there's all that type of really egregious stuff. And then, I mean, just general, like, community well-being stuff. You know, the parking lot is very poorly maintained. It's just, like, incredibly pothole-ridden and not uh, not good on your car to be mm-hmm. um, driving through. Um, things like advertised amenities, like the pool is never functioning, even though that's, like, one of their big, like, selling points. Um, yeah, pretty much that's just a small spattering of it. I think, like, by the time we put the demand letter together, it was, like, 16 different demands on there um but in any case um we uh once we kind of like had identified those main problems we put together a draft um letter and i gotta say also too like the the two lead tenants on that that originally reached out to us like just did an incredible job of hitting the ground running and were like really naturals at being willing to like put their necks out there and talk to their neighbors um it, it was really impressive to see you know just how much energy um they put into that so um, anyway, we kind of just brought around that demand letter um, and started collecting signatures for it for, like, the next month. We were able to hit, I think, almost every one of those 31 buildings. It took a lot of time and a lot of people power. Um, but we were eventually able to gather about 150 signatures. Um, so over 50%, because I'd say there's probably, like, I know Jade said there's, like, a 300, 300 units there. Probably only 70 to 80% of those are occupied. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, we always we're, always try to hit about half about majorities before yeah. moving forward with like yeah. a collective action like that. Nice. Yeah. So we, uh, we just called a tenant meeting. Um, and we honestly weren't, at least I wasn't planning on like putting to a vote to like unionize right mm-hmm. then and there. I think that the way that I had it and at least my head, and I, I think this probably goes for everybody is we were just going to come up with a plan to deliver the demand letter and then, you know, hope that that like struggle for those demands would come out with a union on the other end um, until like Elevate decided to actually do something for once that uh, cease and desist letter Jade mentioned mm-hmm. earlier. Mm-hmm. They, their lawyer uh, sent us this was effectively a cease and desist saying we couldn't hold meetings there. You're not allowed to come on the property. Um, couldn't fire. 
no flyers. Yeah. So it's like, what, like, so do you think like tenants don't have a right to like assembly and free speech or like, are they not allowed to invite people over? Cause it's not totalitarian dictatorship. It's not like it's like 50 OTU people coming over to like hang out with 10 tenants, you know, like there's probably five, five or six of us there to about three dozen tenants. Um, once we did have the meeting, but anyway, um, so since they were kind of going on the offensive there, we talked to the like lead tenants and we decided we got to do the same and just like put the union question point blank. Um, and so we showed up to the tenants meeting. We we're expecting the landlords or some of their representatives to try to stop us in some fashion, even like mildly, but they just didn't show up at all. <laughs> um, so we went over everything um, and then we just kind of put the question to them, like, do you guys want to form a union and uh overwhelmingly voted in favor um and so that then represents uh nebraska's first ever tenants union as far as we as far as we know anyway i'm sure there's been attempts and yeah wherever uh, there have been tenants there have been tenants fighting back but in sure. sort of the historical record from what we've been able to find that's the case yeah. so it's not only a big win for your organization historically and for the metro city of omaha it's a historic accomplishment yeah. and it was yeah. really propelled forward quickly by the tenants themselves not forced by OTU, right? You were going in there with smaller ideas, and the tenants were like, "Let's go, let's go harder." In the sense of, "Let's form a union right away." I mean, I think I, that's that was definitely our idea at some point. I mean, sure. we certainly saw it as an opportunity to form a tenants union, but I don't think we saw it coming that quickly. Yeah, right? I think we were going to float the idea just to sort of bring it up into the. I don't know, consciousness. And I think we were going to ask people to sign up to be part of like an organizing committee, um, which is most of the, what we ended up doing anyways. Um, and that sort of happens through, uh, we mentioned a few times, but like tenant captains. So people within a building that are taking a little bit more responsibility to regularly come out to sort of like a uh, monthly or sort of whatever it looks like tenant meetings and then be in touch with their neighbors about what we sort of decided on, like let them know if there's going to be a mobilization, things like that. So building out some more of the structure of the union mm-hmm. through those tenant captains. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. So, so there's this process where you, you you understand there's issues. Somebody reaches out to you, maybe even one person at first. You canvas, you go around, you take notes of, of major issues that are recurring issues that multiple tenants have. Just make a, a big ass list of it. You get a eventually you want to get a you don't need to, but it's best to try to get a majority of the tenants on board with something, moving forward with something, yes. so that you have that that numerical leverage against the property owners. Um, you have a tenant meeting. Eventually, you create a demand list, sort of synthesizing all these various concerns that tenants have or these needs that are not being met. And then eventually, that even led to the formation of, of a union itself. And this whole time, this this um, corporate landlord is trying to scare you with their big money and their lawyers and a cease and desist. They don't they don't know enough about you to know that you n- you can navigate those things that you're not going to be you know spooked away from doing this um they're sort of, sort of naive about how advanced uh, an organization like OTU is with their understanding of how these things work but just the yeah just the idea of this absentee land corporate landlord that doesn't solve any problems doesn't even return letters or calls or take up tickets but automatically wants to dictate Tenants aren't allowed to invite you yeah. onto the property. <laughs> they're not allowed. To, they're not allowed to freely associate anymore. They're to come home from work and go immediately into their. House. It's like it's so fucking absurd. probably the first time they had like communicated with tenants in a timely manner in yeah. months. <laughs> like yeah. that fire under their ass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I yeah, I appreciate you saying that it was like us having an advanced analysis or however you sort of phrase it. But I think like anybody who's trying to do this thing, if you receive that sort of like um, pushback from the landlord, even if it's kind of minor, like. To keep it in mind and like inoculate tenants against it, but like we, you can't give up on the first sort of like sign of retaliation from the landlord yeah. because that one, it shows landlords that like that is a tactic that works, that they can send a scary letter and that the problems that they're having will go away. Mm. Um, and like, uh, two, it like shows to tenants that you're not very serious about the commitment you have to them. Um, mm. And like when we're going around, part of the reason that we go for majorities is that's what we tell tenants. We say that we're going to have a majority of tenants before we send this in to reduce the chances that you're retaliated against. Yeah. Right, exactly. We're not putting people out there on an island ever. That's a great. That's that's so important. And that's the most common question obviously is like will we be retaliated against? Um and I think, you know, anecdotally at least kind of what I always tell tenants like in my time with OTU <laughs> tenants are almost always being retaliated against like far more prior to reaching out to OTU precisely because the landlord thinks this is one person that 
you know, if, if I can't just simply ignore them, then I can bully and intimidate them mm-hmm. into shutting up. And then, like, their tune will change pretty rapidly once they see, like, OTU is involved, um, at least on, like, you know, that individual level. But, you know, that's only compounded by, by when you're coming together with your fellow tenants to form a union. Because at the end of the day, they, they still have to make money. And not to say that, like, landlords are necessarily afraid of doing mass evictions, because they will do that from time to time. Mm-hmm. But... Um, I mean, in elevated circumstances, it's clear they have financial problems, and I don't think they could afford to just boot all 150 people that signed that yeah. mm-hmm. petition. Um, and so, you know, you automatically create a much greater degree of protection for yourself and neighbors through that alone, I think. Um, and, yeah, and, and, and it also, I mean, there, I think it also keeps people more safe too because the landlord can't it's hard for them to like rapidly identify who are the like quote unquote instigators amongst mm-hmm. the tenants like who's like because they, they have no way to know who the tenant they have no connections are, to these people really yeah, yeah. um so they kind of just the exploited of a sea of names and so it's like who who do you retaliate against mm-hmm. then and it's like if you're going to then you're just creating a really bad narrative for yourself which i'll tell you right now ot will exploit <laughs> and, uh, and yeah so there's the the power in numbers thing uh, rings pretty true, I think, in that situation. I, I love the strategy, um, you know, the strategic thinking on, on your part. You're like, you know, you know, if you just open up a, a weakness, we'll exploit it. But also, like, understanding elevate to, to the extent that you could say they have certain fiscal issues. That's a weak point. They can't necessarily, you know, afford to lose half their tenants in this property without big problems coming their way. And so we're going to exploit that. And it's clear that they don't understand you. Oh, we'll spook these guys with just a little cease and desist letter from an official lawyer. There's there's no comprehension of where you're coming from, of the, the ideology, of your history. But I'm sure part of the information gathering process is understanding who this landlord is, what their history is, you know, what their weak points are, how many other properties they own. And so just having that knowledge advantage. I think is, is really interesting. And, well, if, and sending a really quick, like sending a letter like that, I mean, is already just a show of weakness. Cause I mean, it shows uh, just how like deeply cynical these people are. Like you yeah. have such a low level of regard, like not only for OTU, like just like whatever, they can think whatever they want about us. But, but like, you really think like all of your tenants think they're not allowed to like get together on a basketball court. Right. Like, that they they don't have rights to invite people <laughs> over to like simply like gather in groups of more than two people and talk to one another like that's like that that's like the level of respect that your exactly. average landlord has for a tenant's mind and it's I laugh but I mean it, it's so it's so fucking disrespectful mm-hmm. um, it's pretty insane but I mean it shows how scared they are too by these things I mean I don't think you're doing a good organizing I would go so far as to say, like, if you're not receiving some level of retaliation, then you're not you're not really uh, hitting the right pressure points. Like, yeah. I mean, I think like any sort of effective organizing is going to necessarily have a reaction to some degree, and um, that's just a show of their own weakness and a sign that like what we're doing works and is a real threat to the way that they go about their business. And they're totally unprepared for it. You know, when you were talking earlier about this horrible loop of, like, trying to send through an issue and then nobody ever receiving it and getting the call run around and then leaving a message that never gets responded to, it's like the the, the worst horrors of basic, you know, customer service loops that you get stuck in when you need to follow up on a bill or, you know, reach somebody to, for about a problem. And these companies purposefully and consciously put you into a never-ending loop with hopes that you'll eventually just give the fuck up. Mm-hmm. That applied to landlordism. You know, that applied to, like, your housing situation is just so fucking dystopian. Um, and it is criminal. And it's disgusting that that shit is, is even allowed at all. Um, and, and, you know, in, in a functioning society, God forbid a socialist society, the state would impose these things and it would never really get to this problem. But in a, in a situation where you have just the state on the side of landlords and bosses and property owners in their interest fundamentally... Yeah, let these guys run wild and do whatever the fuck they want. And then the regular people have to come together and fight back from the bottom up, you know, with yeah. little to no structural top down help. Yeah. And I think that's particularly true in Omaha. And Jade can probably expand on this more because I'm cribbing a lot from him, actually. <laughs> but like, I think like 
you know, Omaha really lets landlords just do whatever the hell they want. Um, I mean, the city's completely bought and sold it to developers because there's mm-hmm. Omaha really doesn't have like, at least in the eyes of the people that run it, doesn't have an identity. Um, and that's largely due to, you know, a lot of our manufacturing is gone. We're a highly, like, service and, like, financial-based town. Um, but I think, I think you know, in, like, city council's mind, if we just, like, give things up to developers, let them, like, throw up those, like, shitty, like, like Art Deco or whatever the hell, like, postmodern-looking gentrifier yeah, buildings. Not even Art Deco. Yeah, be that'll nice. <laughs> get us to, that'll, like, turn us into a modern city because we don't feel like a big mm-hmm. city, but we want to be like them. And if we just let them do that, you know, no real, like, actual crafting this town into a place that has its own identity or like you know meaningful expression of who we are but like by just tearing things down and then building up the most like plastic boring looking gentrifying households Mm -hmm. that you can and just letting landlords do whatever like that will form That'll like give us meaning, and uh, I don't know. Some it will yeah. be more like the big guys. It's this soulless corporate non-vision. Yeah, you know, non-community, non-vision, non-sense of place or spirit or anything. Just a full capitulation to capital as such as the only meaningful thing that you can turn to if you want to build anything, and just letting them run rampant with it. And it fucking sucks, you know? Yeah, and I generally I think they're very afraid to limit the power of landlords in any fashion. They're, so a few years back, uh, we got involved in a struggle around tax increment financing yeah. um, mm. for a particular landlord, Dave Paldino, rest in peace. Um, <laughs> who, <laughs> he died on a plane crash. Yeah, yeah horrible <laughs> slumlord. Um, he would, actually had a show where he bragged about uh, how much of a slumlord he was. I think there's some episodes still on YouTube uh, of The Super. Of yeah. yeah. Uh, and so we sort of uh, used the leverage there of him having to beg the city for money to invest, you know, build some new uh, property um, and just sort of made the point like this guy is not doing his very basic job of being a landlord, even in the eyes of like, I don't know, the sort of like liberal pro housing folks um, and uh, use that vote to kind of hold his development plans hostage. And the city council actually ended up voting it down. Um, and as part of this, started to look into more, like, how can we uh, hold landlords more accountable? Mm. And the uh, route they took was through creating a landlord registry. Um, in this sort of model, they'd said, like, oh, this is what Kansas City is doing. And Minneapolis is a few years back, right? We're sort of just copying from the other big Midwestern cities. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and they, But they've never enforced the registry. There's, like, a small fee you have to pay if you don't want to register, and most landlords just choose to do that instead. Um mm. Well, and, like, let's be clear, too. Like, even if, like, the registry was fully up and functioning, it's a complete non-solution. Yeah. And I've gotten into these arguments in the OTU Facebook comments with liberals constantly. Because, <laughs> like, you know, the argument is that, well, if people can see that a landlord is really bad, they won't rent from them. Right. Like then, Yelp for landlords? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Then they'll... Then they'll rent somewhere else, and the landlord will be forced to improve their housing... Otherwise, they'll go out of business, which is like, you know, this insane, mm-hmm. like, yeah, exactly. Like free market fetishism bullshit. Yeah. And it's like also completely ignoring all the like structural issues as to why people have to rent from substandard places to begin with. It's mm-hmm. not for like lack of information. <laughs> exactly. like, it's, exactly. uh, it, it, but that's what they, they really think that that is like some grand step forward in holding landlords accountable. And of course, you know, that's only... That's only on the basis of individual choice, individual consumption habits. And that's, I mean, that speaks more broadly just like how our country views change in general. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's just, a, it's completely absurd to me that people think that that's uh, at all progress. Um, and again, just, you have to be so out of touch and just, I, I don't even know the words for it. Like, you really just have to have zero grasp on like yes. working class reality whatsoever to think that like it's this informed consumer choice. Mm-hmm. And if only we had more information, you know, it's very like techno. It's like simultaneously laissez faire yeah. and like technocratic. Absolutely, like uh, that. That will be like the the method of social change somehow, and that's the farthest they're willing to go. Yeah, and I guess the other method that, like, is sort of, in theory, the city is, uses to hold landlords is kind of was code enforcement, and I don't know how much we're going to do it, but, like, just really briefly, like, there are certain habitability requirements that cities uphold, and there are code inspectors, but you can just read through, landlords are allowed to appeal out of those, mm-hmm. and so you can read the minutes of, like, where they make those appeals, and just see how freely, like, 
the board in charge of enforcing that is like, oh, we'll give you another six months to fix mm. this, you know, horrible conditions that your tenant is dealing with and has brought to our attention. Um, yeah. Yeah, it just shows the, the exploitative nature of the relationship, the embeddedness of power and wealth into structures of ostensible democracy, which clearly doesn't exist, and then how devoid liberalism is of any solutions to anything. Yeah. yeah. You know, like the idea that you're going to use the free market to fix the problems of the free market. Like, what is this Reagan era 80s or Clintonian it, yeah. 90s nonsense? Mm-hmm. It's insane. And I think one last thing really quickly, Jade mentioned the like tax increment financing thing. I think like just like one more illustration of just uh, how little the city gives a shit about anything. Um, to be clear, like that is the first time a tax increment financing application has been denied since the program was instituted in, I believe, the late 80s. Yeah, it's kind of became popular across the country around that time. Um, the idea of it, just really quickly, yeah, is please, that I was gonna ask. Um, there are parts of downtowns in particular, like cities in particular, that can be deemed blighted. Um, and I couldn't tell you exactly the sort of definition of it, but it's expanded really broadly. So I believe almost all of like downtown Omaha is blighted, like little stretches of into north and south Omaha and then sort of west from there are blighted. And they encourage development in there by essentially letting you pay your taxes later Mm. um, and, like, paying – and then also helping pay for, like, uh, sewer and street and other sort of city improvements uh, to encourage this kind of development in these areas that are blighted. So so you you take the the taxes that the developer would need to pay – and you reduce them or stretch them out over a longer period of t- finance your yeah. taxes, kind yes. of. And then you also subsidize certain aspects of it as well from pe- t- tax. Yeah, and those are separate things, but they work in concert almost always. Yeah. Yeah. So typically it's for like just outright gentrifiers. Mm-hmm. Um, in this circumstance, though, like, and the reason we latched onto it, because normally we don't involve ourselves for all the reasons outlined above and others um, in you know city politics as such at all. Um, but Dave Palladino applying there, like, this is just a notorious slumlord who everybody in the city hates. And, you know, for for him to be trying to get uh, tax increment financing dollars is wild because all of his apartments would, I, th- I think you could probably fit those under the definition of blighted pretty damn easily. Yeah. Um, so, like, it's just like a, it's just laughable that somebody who's, like, so cartoon- cartoonishly evil of a slumlord would be going after such a thing. So, like, that's why we thought it was important to step up and, like, build a campaign around that. And we were able to get it successfully shut down. And that's largely all due to, I mean, his tenants, both current and former, um, that were brave enough to stand up and speak out. You know, some of which, like I said, were current tenants who absolutely were facing serious um, chances of being retaliated against and possibly evicted for speaking out. And it was only through, like, being able to mobilize his tenants in that way that we were able to get that stopped. Um, Mm. Had that, you know, had we not done that, it would have kind of just been another, like, blip in Omaha's history. But instead, we were able to pump the brakes on something that's uh, never never been stopped before. Mm. Yeah, and I I think tactically we don't really ever think of the organizing we're doing as something that's trying to change the way that, like, politics, capital P politics yeah. operates. Um, but I think there are times where there are like uh, contradictions within, again, like capital P politics that tenant unions should be open to being involved in. Not as a like, this is our strategy, we're going to get better conditions, but as a like, this is a place where we can fight. Mm. Mm. So this next question is twofold. You can answer either or. What have been some of the biggest obstacles or challenges you faced in years of tenant organizing? And what are some of the worst stories or situations that you've come across in all your organizing? Um, I guess just like speaking to like the immediate situation, um, you know, I think it's one of the biggest challenges is just keeping people engaged even after you have that mm. uh, tenants union. Because I think, you know, even though we got the union and um, – and actually, I, we failed to mention, we could probably talk a little bit more about We've been able to establish two more in Elevate since Fontenelle Hills. Oh, nice. but, um, I'll circle back to that in a second. But, um, you know, I think um, there's a large problem of, like, people are so non-profit-pilled that they think things just kind of, like, an organization like ours is the same that they've always encountered and that it'll kind of just happen. And when mm. it doesn't, like happen right away then kind of just like fall off in engagement a little bit yeah. when you know the key is to have like tenants and in particular like the tenant captains who are like you know the bread and butter of the union to be highly engaged in doing the day-to-day stuff 
Um, and so I think that can be a big challenge. You know, people kind of get wrapped up in a storm of excitement in the moment and, you know, have like high hopes and then they kind of like fall off when, yeah. what, because they don't realize this is like a protracted process. Right. And I think that's something we've definitely like learned from. And, you know, even as recently as our most recent mass meeting a couple nights ago, I think we've done a lot better job of like trying to set expectations of like what's needed for this to go well and you know emphasizing that like just us sending this demand letter isn't going to get the job done we have to be like really willing to fight for that and of course we always have emphasized that but i think still people kind of just um i don't know i think it's easy to get like complacent and not really i don't know view it as like a service as opposed to like i am i'm organizing and i'm organizing this with this group or, yeah i think this is a hard thing for us as like external organizers um to or in particular like volunteer ones who maybe can give five or ten hours a week um like it's difficult for us to know when to like say okay we've canvassed a hundred times like let us come and you know let us finish off that building for you versus sort of making the hard ask of like okay you need to go and chat with these people because otherwise we're not gonna be able to get these signatures mm-hmm. like like finding the balance between when to make the hard ask and uh you know, develop people and um, when to just sort of, I guess, step in. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I can see that definitely being a thing. It's it's also kind of a human thing um, of, yeah, getting wor- excited about the initial thing, even if it's like in your own personal life, like I'm going to start working out on January 1st and then it sort of fizzles out. You got to have that. I guess you were saying one way you can try to hedge against that is to front load these conversations like this is a protracted process. This is going to require some, you know, initiative on your part and some work on your part. And, and I, I assume having some good tenant captains goes a really long way in keeping that momentum going. Um, yeah, and I think, too, you know, like, I think the blessing and the curse, like, when we were talking about earlier, like, as housing conditions deteriorate more and more, you know, there are more um, slightly better off tenants mm-hmm. getting involved. And I think... I think at times, too, that can be a problem in a way because, you know, those people maybe don't have as much to lose yeah. as their um, as some of their other fellow tenants. Mm-hmm. But it's oftentimes those people who, like, will immediately, like, hmm. be like you know, I want to do something, but then it's not as, like, life or death to them, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. And that's not – I'm not trying to, like, be overly negative or, like, shit on those – people whatsoever but i think it is just kind of you know objectively speaking they're maybe a bit more secure than what we than the type of people that we traditionally think of occupying like quote unquote slums Mm -hmm. um and so they don't have as much invested interest because it is more easier for them to simply move um and you know never mind like the trappings of their class consciousness as well. But, you know, even though they are heavily exploited and they are workers, they do have this uh, added degree of a labor aristocracy, one might say. A tenant aristocracy. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And so I think that uh, can also create challenges too. But, um, yeah, and I I guess one interesting one that we had, for example, with, like, Fontanelle Hills, there was a a brief moment where... uh, a guy mm-hmm. that lived there reached out to us um, and was talking about how I'm a I'm really involved in my union. Like I he'll handle negotiations. I was like, oh cool, like come to the next meeting, or whatever. Well, it turned out that the union he was referring to was the Fraternal Order of Police. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we were like, so we just like didn't really respond right away, and we eventually told him no after we had talked to to the rest of the tenant captains. And most of the tenant captains were in agreement. Um, yeah. I think about half were just outright, like, I don't want this to happen. And yeah. then another quarter were like, I can see these sort of concerns, like, you know, I don't I have don't anything. don't really care yeah. either mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. But then, unfortunately, there were, there was one person who, like, really took great offense to that. Um, and they, they had been one of the main uh, organizers from the jump, Um apparently their parents are involved in real estate is what it turned out. They went back home for a weekend and they started like, as soon as they came back, they were spinning all these yarns about how we could be sued for discrimination Uh and shit, which we can discriminate against the cops. Like, yeah, yeah, you can't, that's not how to jail for 10 years. But I I guess I'd, so, but I mean, it was like kind of, and so they, they left because they felt like, um, 
you know, if I'm going to be a part of something, I want it to be for the right reasons, and I can't stand for discrimination against anybody, Amazing. which, like, Amazing. you know, blow my brains out. But, like, I guess, like, <laughs> but that was nonetheless, you know, it sucks to, like, see that happen, even yeah. though if I think it's, like, that person is obviously objectively incorrect and it, that, that's fucked up. And, of course, they went on to try to, like, spew bullshit about OTU, and uh, they tried to forcibly allow the cop into, like, the, like, social media group that we created for tenants and stuff. Um, so, I mean, that, but it, nonetheless, you know, it is very disheartening to see, like, somebody who was initially, like, seemingly really mm-hmm. on board all of a sudden, like, just really crash out over, like, this cop question and go on, like, a spree of just, like, um, I mean, frankly, union busting and, like, uh, you know, wrecking Wrecker-ism. behavior. Yeah. 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 And you you worry about that spreading. Unfortunately, it didn't. Um, you know, nobody else like left over that. But I think I say all that I think because it it does show that there are a lot of class dynamics in these places. That like even though there might be some like shitty apartments with a lot of problems, mm-hmm. just because of how deep the housing crisis is, you do get a lot of people that um, maybe come from slightly more privileged backgrounds mm-hmm. and are living here due to circumstance or maybe they come from like a weird ideological background and that's all a very like uneven territory to navigate you know there's no like tenant consciousness i guess like collectively speaking as of yet so you have to deal with like a variety of different like um class backgrounds and class consciousness that that can provide like serious challenges because i mean like what if that what if that person had gone around to like every single tent it wasn't just like making like shitty posts on facebook that we could delete really quickly right. but like was like really going around trying to like slander things you know mm-hmm. that would be that would be like a problem and i was frankly really fucking worried about that um and unfortunately it didn't get to that but those are just that's just like one example of how there's a lot of different stuff at play that uh really <laughs> creates a lot of interesting situations and i think navigating that is a really big challenge too. Yeah, I think that speaks too to like uh, what I was talking about earlier with like the problem of people not having experience being in an organization. Um, just to like, I don't know, given a build on this, like if Omaha Times United makes a decision, we've had this debate in the general meeting, we've made a decision, I'm on the losing side of the vote, I'm going to go with that decision, right? Like we're, I'd say we operate in the democratic centrist fashion in that sense, mm, yeah. not in the sense people use it, misuse the term, but yeah. like, and I think that most organizations should operate that way, right? Like if you've made a, you've got a question in front of you, you've made a decision, even if you don't agree with that decision, you have to go along with that. That's part of being in an organization and having like responsibility and discipline to each other. Absolutely. Um, given that there's like true democratic debate. And that's sort of what happened here, right? Like we had this discussion about this situation. The majority of people felt like it was going to make us less safe. It was going to drive people away. And this single person disagreed with that decision and decided to go and then yeah act, before a vote act was poorly. even held yeah yeah and I should also throw in there that the cop in question before we even told him he couldn't join proceeded to like go on a spree of not only blowing up our phone but mm-hmm. blowing up like women and femme organizers phones that they knew were in the union and stuff at like midnight like making Just all these crazy down. calls leaving long voicemails like. Which should have been all the confirmation that you yeah, need absolutely. that, like, maybe, like, e- like even if you set the cop question aside for a sec, which you really can't, like, you would hope, like, in this, like, wrecker's eyes, they would see, well, this is definitely an unstable an fucking person level. who should yeah. not, is making the place unsafe whether or not they're a cop. And you would think that would be the end of it, but... Uh, there's just way too many ideological commitments. Because <laughs> I, I remember me and you discussed that at, at our San Volleyball League um, about the, the cop situation. And, and it's not it's not an inherently impossible thing. Like, there could be a situation where you have a bunch of tenants. One of them happens to be a cop, but he is humbly just like, I do, do have these situations in my housing. You know, maybe I have a young child and the guy doesn't come over and fix my heating unit. Like I could humbly submit myself to this broader organization and process. I don't need to put myself at the head of anything. I just want to, I want to help everybody here. Like there's a, you could imagine a scenario in which, okay. And then you bring it to the people and the tenants are like, that's totally fine. I know the guy, you know, Gary down the thing. He helped me with my groceries once, or he's a nice guy. I let him in. That's totally fine. You could imagine it. But yeah, just his personality where he immediately just is entitled to it, doesn't get it, starts fucking up other, you know, blowing people's phones up, acting like a freak, intimidating people basically by that unhinged behavior. And it's like, yeah, well, that's the exact reason we don't want to fucking yeah. 
cop in our organization. You well, know? I think to be clear, like even if like a cop like came like, you know, like I said, had in their hand, like I get why people might be uncomfortable totally, with this, but totally. just like let me know if there's anything I can do to help. Yeah. Like, it's still like never allow them like membership. Right. Well, definitely not an OTU. I guess like for a local, that's there's only so much. We can yeah, I think say about that. That's kind of locals' yeah. decision. I think yeah. the other thing I tell people is like, but, you have to know who can organize who, right? And if there's someone that is like, okay, I'm fine with letting this person know what's going on secondhand, like they can come out to the, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was like thinking this through. I was like, what if we had a protest? Like, who's going to come and, you know, ha- uh, respond to that protest? Mm-hmm. It's probably like the police department. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, we know that our police department here has inter organizational agreements with every surrounding police department, right? Even if he's a cop down in Sarpy County or whatever, like, there's no reason to think that he wouldn't be on due that day against totally. our action that we'd planned to, you know, yeah. like, there's deep, deep, real concerns for yes. sure. Absolutely. Um, well, one thing that comes out organizationally is like with this tenant organizing, you mentioned democratic centralism, but also almost de facto, there's the, there's the application of the mass line as well. I don't think you could do tenant organizing without the mass line. Like what would that even look like? Right. I mean, obviously the mass line is a crucial to all forms of, of effective organizing, um, but particularly here, it's not even like you have to implement it as some ideological conscious imposition on the organization. It's like that's how you tend to organize. You go to the tenants, you see their problems, you collect them, you synthesize their complaints, you bring it back to them, you have them vote on the demand list, and you move forward collectively. Um, so I just once again, you know, even in the in the, in the context of tenant organizing, these two crucial aspects of socialist organizing continue to pop up as su- superior and necessary forms of it. Yeah, and oh, sorry. If, um, to kind of connect, this isn't like the cleanest transition here, but I was uh, thinking about this earlier with your question about like, um, I don't know, issues we're facing or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, the, and then you sort of gave the example of folks that are connected to the left ve- purely through being like online or whatever. Mm-hmm. I think the quickest way to change that is to think through like, how can I start to organize my own neighbors? And like, I think one of the things that has changed in the last six months that we're doing a much better job of is like, bringing in members to the organization who are joining because they want to do that activity, right? Like they want to organize their neighbors and they have a plan in place already to start doing that. And they need our support to do it, right? Like we have some expertise that we've picked up over the years of like, here's some strategies and tactics you can use to like fight the landlord and to be more effective in like talking to people and running meetings. But they're wanting to go and run with this thing Mm. of like being more connected. And if you're like listening to this and you want to like know what should I do first, like find out if there's a tenant in your area. But if there's not, like you can start doing this. Yes. You can start to connect with your neighbors. You can start to figure out the problems they have. um, And you can start to fight back. The barrier to entry for tenant organizing is pretty fucking low. Yeah. Yeah. Which means it really costs us printing paper, Mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, now, the other part of that question we didn't quite get to was just like a horror stories about certain terrible conditions. Um, we, we mentioned that uh, Dino guy, the, the Saladino guy, whatever the fuck his name is, I forget it, um, as a particularly exploitative landlord, slumlord. Um, but what are some of the worst conditions you've come across over your years at, at OTU? Or any, any story that jumps to your mind? Hmm. I, re- I don't know. I reject the question a little bit. I, you know, that people want to like hear, you know, some sort of visceral thing. Um, I, like, it's people live in like, people are forced to live in ways that are not just by all sorts of landlords. Um, like with, and I think are just very dis- landlords as well are just very dismissive of like how bad some things can be. Mm-hmm. Um, like living with bugs, for example, like this, you know the sort of psychological effect that that can have um, and like the insecurity it can create like mold is a really big one that we run into all the time where you know there's just like slow water leaks and I I think it's invisible a lot of times right like Mm -hmm. um, and by the point where we're seeing these horrible pictures of like black mold and coming out of someone's ceiling in their bathroom right like the other side of that wall looks horrible Um, I uh, yeah I mean I I imagine in any city you can go through the archives of your local channel three or whatever and they will have a photo gallery of horrible conditions that someone Mm -hmm. is dealing with but you see bugs come up a lot and mold come up a lot i assume mold Mm -hmm, is fucking terrible and the mold toxicity is absolutely brutal if you have infants or elderly people or immunocompromised people mold is you know extra disastrous and it is so ubiquitous in so many different places it's hidden People go for years with certain conditions, deepening neurological issues, and they can't figure it out. They bounce around doctor to doctor, and the whole fucking time it was mold on the inside of their walls in their home. Mm -hmm. Um, Turning your home, the one place of safety 
for you and your family into its it, the singular threat against the safety of your family. It's, it's t- terrible. Yeah, and I think, like, I, and I do want to be clear, too, like, um, you know, things don't have to be, like, to that level of bad to begin organizing either. Like, we don't mm-hmm. seek out the worst possible places that we can find in order in order to organize in them. Um, the key thing is, is that, I mean, as we said before, like, you're in a fundamentally exploitative relationship here like uh you know landlords just profiteer off people endlessly for uh, for doing nothing and so like even if it's not to the point where like black mold is all in the walls and there's roaches everywhere and stuff there's almost inevitably at just about any building something that can be organized around um and something that can like bring people together Mm -hmm. more in order to in order to to get organized and fight back against their landlord and try to make concessions and show that like you know this is not just going to be like a a one way out mm-hmm. like relationship where we just send things but that like we're trying to balance this the scales um and I think like you know Fontenelle Hills there's a shit ton of mold problems there too i sh- I guess I should have mentioned um yeah. but you know there like I said it's a pretty it's a cool place. Like it, it really feels is. like a camp. Like, uh, yeah, it's hilly. It's, it's, it's yeah, in a beautiful it's woodsy. part. There's deer walking yeah. through the. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's a beautiful part of the area. And I've even looked at it in the past when I was younger as a place I might want to live because it just is a really beautiful little apartment yeah. complex mm-hmm. in a really nature oriented area. And had it not been left to deteriorate, it would probably be a phenomenal place to live. And you know, it's still not like I mean, it's not like the the ceilings are falling in and stuff. But there's a thousand percent. There's a thousand like concrete ways in which that place can be improved, um, and that gives us a thousand different ways to organize people around common issues, um, and you know, participate in class struggle, yeah. um, and really begin to build tenant power which is you know our ultimate goal is to build like a city-wide tenants union and like these mm. little locals there are the are the seeds of that and so it's not it's not just about um trying to solely go to like the worst conditions possible but um finding places that provide good organizing opportunities yeah and we've talked a lot about like the sort of negative vision of tenant raising, right like we have to fight the landlord but we also i think very much have a positive vision and that is that like one, we don't need landlords. We can Absolutely. bring people together to begin to take care of each other, to begin to look out for each other, and to be able to run our own lives. Um, and there's no reason that, like, that, you know, beautiful place in, in the hills can't be turned into, like, a, you know, not to take a stance on, like, Topa, tenant interrupting and purchase, and, like, work co-ops and things like that. We don't need to jump into all that. But, like, <laughs> the, we really do not need landlords. People don't need yeah. someone to do the sort of basic job of, well, in this case, ignoring their maintenance requests and cashing the checks um but generally speaking of you know holding people ransom every single month Mm -hmm. we are able to run our own lives yeah and the way the mechanism that we will be able to do that i think will it won't necessarily look like the tenant union structure but i think that that carries a lot of the answers for what it might look like just like the boss needs workers but workers don't necessarily need the boss yes landlords need tenants tenants don't necessarily need a landlord Mm -hmm. and our vision for the future of a democratically egalitarian cooperative society um, where there are no exploiters no rulers nobody benefiting off the poverty or immiseration of another is a world without these relationships at all and so part of the process of getting there is to struggle on behalf of the the side of these relationships that are the exploited against the exploiters always with that broader vision of a dignified society with these these sort of relationships, these social relations of exploitation and domination don't exist. And I really actually do appreciate, Jade, earlier you said you sort of reject the question of these of these visceral horror stories because what we're talking about is not necessarily the headline-grabbing horror stories of look at how terrible this situation is, but just the baseline dignity of having a safe, clean home and a prompt response to issues when they arise. That is that is what should be focused on and, and should be the baseline. And the horror stories are, are certainly out there and they're everywhere, unfortunately. But just literally just the dignity of having a safe and clean home is what we're fighting for here. Um, yeah, and a responsive. Yeah. If you're going to be a landlord, if that's your position, you're going to make your income off of that, do your fucking half of the bargain when you need to. At least do that, you know? Yeah. 
well, before think, we move to a world where you don't exist. <laughs> yeah, and I think, uh, you know, to Jade's point about, um, you know, having a positive program of, like, what social housing could look like earlier, I think um, going back to, like, the challenges part, I think that's actually, like, the biggest challenge. Like, I mean, we can talk about a million different, like, micro um, challenges in any given organizing campaign that we do. But I think the the biggest challenge is how do we connect this to a broader political struggle and avoid just simply being economists and, you know, just mm. only getting like small short term games gains for people, um, which, you know, is positive. And again, like, I think that is useful because it shows people that class struggle can work to change your material conditions. But I think ultimately, like as communists, we, if we view this as a part of a broader revolutionary project, we do got to think about, well, how do we, how do we form this into like a real, like political movement that's mm. really like demanding more um and those are tough questions to answer i mean my my answer would be and jade's probably disagree with me is that mm-hmm. we need we need a revolutionary party in order to do that mm. um but you know um in our like marxist study group right now which as i mentioned before a couple of the tents we've been organizing have been coming to we're reading um jmp's um politics and command mm-hmm. a taxonomy of Economism, who I know you, he's come on to talk about that book yeah. before. And so we are trying to be more serious about, like, working through those problems. You know, Marxist Study Group isn't, like, necessarily an OTU thing, even though a lot of OTU people are involved. Um, but, you know, I think we're trying to take seriously that question of, like, how how do we go from just, like, getting these wins, which are great. Again, like, I'm not trying to, like, denigrate or minimize those at all because i think they're extremely important but how do we at some point take that a step further you know we got we got three tenant unions right now um hopefully knock on wood two more on the way Mm. um so like at what point does that you know we can make every like tenant union in the city like, but at what point is like does that become not enough like how do we like cross that threshold into like this is like a serious like political force Mm. demanding like fundamental transformations on how society works. And like Mm. at the end of the day, that like that to me is the ultimate goal. Um, But that is, that is a hard, (laughs) that is a very hard threshold to cross. And so, but it's something, you know, I take very seriously and, and that's why we're trying to actively study those questions. But I think that is fundamentally the biggest challenge is how do we keep this from just being like an ends to itself although Mm. it may be a very positive end don't get me wrong it's not it's not stopping capitalism Mm. it's not it's not uh, stopping our planet from uh you know being completely fucking microwaved so it's like how do we use this to advance the class struggle more broadly um we don't quite have the answers to that yet but uh, I, i think that's absolutely critical and i you know and i think like I said earlier, starting to like collaborate with other organizations more like doing, uh, doing anti-imperialist work, um, and tying these like specific struggles together. I think that's like a step in that direction. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, that's, that's still a very small step. So I yeah. think that's like the biggest, like long-term challenge to me too. It's incredibly important. I'm pro just really quick. I am pro party just for the record here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we have some different ideas of how to maybe arrive at that position. Sure. Um, and Fair. Yeah, yeah, in the long Sorry, term, not even in the medium term. You. No, you're yeah. totally fine. Um, uh, this is maybe overly simplistic, but I think we have a chance to like live out communism through the organizing that we do. And like when we talk about like basic democratic rights, like the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, we were talking about earlier, we did, we did that. Like, right. Our, the right of tenants to have conversations with their neighbors was directly challenged by the landlord in this organizing context. Mm. And we said that that's not the case. This is something they're allowed to do. Um, and if we want to like take the sort of um, like step-by-step thing that like in order to uh, have like a communist revolution, you need to have full democratic rights and those sort of things we can agree to disagree or whatever on that specifically. But those are, I think that is necessary. Yeah. I think it is necessary to have those basic things to build a vote, to live in a legitimate democracy. Absolutely. Um, and we can do that yeah. in small places, in very small places, and then expand those. Yeah. I think the vision of socialism and communism has to be tied to 
that 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 radical vision of expanding democracy. And there are, you know, short term issues you have to deal with. And we all know these arguments about, you know, and being attacked externally and even internally by the forces of reaction and that that distorts things. But we should never fetishize the fact that certain democratic rights have not been able to be able to be stabilized over the long term or expanded. Mm -hmm. We should see that as a as an unfortunate reaction to certain events. But always keep in mind that, yes, I mean, a communist society is a deeply egalitarian democratic society where people have control over their own motherfucking lives. Yeah. And if that is not a v part of your vision of communism, then genuinely we're not interested, you know? Um, so, no, I think that's, that's fucking crucial to it. And I always keep that vision in my head because I believe in human dignity. I believe that human beings are capable of governing themselves in the right context, are capable of 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 controlling their own fucking lives and that that is part and parcel of real radical democracy the democracy we hear about that this system is always pretending to defend is always a false democracy it's a it's a mirage of a democracy um and we want the real damn thing um so yeah yeah i mean i can think of a few things that are more affirming to your dignity than be able to look your boss or your landlord in the eyes and say like fuck off exactly like, this is something you know you exactly. can't take this from us and in the long run, nothing more affirming of your dignity to stand shoulder to shoulder with other human beings as equals mm -hmm. to work toward a higher quality of life for everybody, you know, without any hierarchies of power and domination and exploitation at all. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate vision. All right. Well, let's go ahead and move then towards the end of this conversation, which is for those listening out there, um, what advice would you give that uh, for those who might want to start their own tenant organization, uh, maybe from scratch or maybe they're just beginning? What sort of general baseline advice would you offer? I think that you should find you should try to find five people that would like to do it with you. Um, that's the very first thing of it. If you can't get people in the room for a project, uh, you know that we can. I guess we could give you some advice on how to do that. Actually, sort of thing. Um, yeah, but let's jump into that actually, because we. I think we didn't go into this in our sort of history of OTU thing, but we were in a phase for a while, uh, about a year, where there was not many active meetings going on, and we faced that same question of like, how do we rebuild this organization and bring people into this project? And we just started holding, like, a reading group, actually, mm -hmm. and invited people we knew um, and started to do, again, like, kind of smaller scale, uh, like, sol you know, single tenant kind of cases, maybe trying to bring four or five neighbors together on a thing mm -hmm. while this kind of reading group was going on. Um, and we were just kind of studying co the contemporary tenant movement. Um, I think we read a few other, like, I don't know, theory pieces along with it, kind of mixing and matching stuff. But more just to have, like, a reason to get together once a month and talk about this project that we were trying to do. And those turned into m monthly meetings and the sort of where the organization is at today. Um, but, yeah, get people together, start talking about tenant organizing, just politics in general, and figure out what are places that you can uh, start to make an intervention in small ways and connect yourself to the, like, existing tenant movement. And you might, like, not think that there's an existing tenant movement if there's not an organization that's, like, representing tenants that considers themselves leftist. But in every single place there are tenants, there are tenants that are fighting back in some fashion or mm -hmm. being exploited and not having the tools, you know, and sort of mechanisms with which to fight back. Um, so, yeah, I think connect yourself to that. I think, like, we sort of mentioned this earlier, but, like, as we've been building, we've been finding that there are a lot of people that are already ideologically committed in some fashion to our project that are not connected to it. And we're finding them and we're bringing them into our organization and making Omaha Tennessee United a place where people who want to do this thing, who want to stand up against their landlords, can find support in that mm -hmm. project rather than going at it alone. And I think no matter where you're at, there are people that want to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, as far as, sorry, I'll, I'll uh, circumvent the advice thing really quick, just to like build on what Jade said really quick, because I want to mention earlier. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, been really interesting, too, to see how many like tenants come to us after like running up against a wall of like trying to do things the right way. Mm -hmm. Like people obviously try to submit maintenance requests. Um, then they may get so far as to call the city inspector only to find out, well, <laughs> the city inspector doesn't do anything mm -hmm. other than condemn buildings if they're that bad. Um, and then thirdly, um, people will try to find lawyers. And I can't tell you the amount of people that <laughs> have reached out to us after they've found that, they cannot get a lawyer to represent them because all the lawyers represent hmm. landlords, and they literally won't. I mean, and like Jade said, there certainly are landlords. There, there are lawyers in town that like 
Yeah, bill, it's very, but they're very few and far. Back. It's really difficult to like make money as a lawyer representing tenants because there's very few, at least here in Nebraska, ways for tenants to, like bill landlords for mm-hmm. their like sort of like there's just a few aspects of the law that allow them to um, both get money for the tenants in some fashion, like if they've been wronged, and make money for themselves to actually do mm-hmm. the pay their own bills. Um, see, yeah. It's far more profitable if you're if you know anything about the tenant landlord law to represent landlords. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, sorry, that was an aside. Um, you can chop that out if you want. Okay. But um, I guess um, my advice, though, is just um, just try to push back and see what happens. Because especially like when you're first starting out with was largely um, small private landlords, um, which I think is another interesting trend. It seems like we're coming up more and more against corporate landlords on mm-hmm. our regular basis compared to at the beginning, I recall. Um, it was largely individual landlords, you know, running their particular company. But, um, anyway, I say that to like, um, like when you push back, you'll be shocked at like how many landlords, particularly those individual ones are just like scared shitless and mm-hmm. will fold immediately just cause they don't want it going any farther than right. that. Um, and I think that's maybe, you know, I think that's one missed opportunity that we had in the early days when we were largely pursuing like individual things just to show that this like method worked was that maybe we could have tried to bring those around into more collective struggles sooner Mm -hmm. Um, because it's very clear like in multiple instances where like landlords would just as soon as OTU got involved would just like kind of give up yeah capitulate immediately and I think that that showed a definite sign of weakness and so I think that's probably one criticism that I'd have of ourselves back then as we maybe didn't recognize that that was a point of weakness and that they are so scared that it would mm-hmm. turn into a bigger thing that they were willing to just like give up that quickly um, that we could have you know maybe taken some of those opportunities to build larger collective struggles but all that to be said I guess is that like um, landlords aren't used to being confronted in a collective manner whether that's an individual with an organization behind them or multiple tenants coming together to form a union they are simply nobody puts their foot down with them. Usually people throw their hands up in the air and get exhausted because, like I said, they try every option that you're supposed to use Mm -hmm. and find none of them work, and they kind of just give up. But when, like, people don't give up, and when you, like, really push them, when you get them off of their home turf, which is, you know, basically in the courts and um, just kind of individual relations, when you're taking collective action, whatever form that might happen. They, they're they very put off balance quickly. Yeah, they don't and, expect it. And they don't expect it. And, like, um, I think you'd be surprised just how quickly you can find success um, organizing around these issues. And it, it may seem difficult, um, but it's really pretty simple, and you just got to dare to struggle and dare to win. Yeah, I think one of the ways that we presented like the work we're doing is like we're trying to um build structures through which people can do communism and that's like a really nice way to put what we're doing another way to put what we're doing is that we are taking the existing legal rights that tenants have and we are actually trying to enforce them mm. and we're trying to help tenants enforce them because the almost all of these sort of like organizing we're doing the demands we make are actually just asking landlords to follow the law Mm -hmm. Um, and we're trying to enforce that following of the law outside of the courts through direct action and through tenant struggle but very rarely are we asking for things that go beyond the legal rights that tenants are already granted and I think that is probably where I would start is like you know to a certain extent like figuring out what some of those basic rights are and ways that you can um, take action in whatever sort of method works best to like fight them Um, if we had better laws for like tenants and tenants were able to represent themselves we might actually use the courts as a as a site of struggle it just doesn't work like there's no reason for us to waste our time doing that if that's a situation you have though where you have a history of tenant struggle and like that's um something that's possible like you should use whatever battlefield you can Mm -hmm. but and also on the other token don't be afraid to go above and beyond what's in those laws um because, I mean, frankly, we operate in a highly gray <laughs> legal mm-hmm. area. I mean, any landlord could just, like, tell us to fuck off, basically, yeah. and ignore us, and that would be that. Um, yeah. I mean, I think there's an implication that we could follow up on the sort of laws that we mentioned in our demand letters in the courts and maybe would be found correct. We just don't see any reason. Yeah, like, we generally, really do we don't that. need to. Yeah. 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 But, I mean, also, I mean, we've been able to get stuff that's well beyond um, – yeah what is outlined like i can think of one example 
Um, actually, one guy who found out about OTU through RevLeft is oh, funny. Nice. Reached out because him and his wife were having a bunch of problems with their AC mm. being broken for months on end. I mean, it was like Jesus. it was like 80 plus degrees in there on a day to day basis. They had to move their daughter back to her baby daddy's place because she was having heat exhaustion symptoms. Oh they God. bought like a bunch of cooling units and stuff to try to like make it you know livable yeah. and that you know was just pouring money down the drain basically they had these crazy elevated um electrical bills and stuff and um Damn. we were able to we sent out the demand letter and demanded that the landlord sit down with us to discuss these problems um <laughs> once again the the problem was nowhere near as complicated as the landlord made it seem the we were able to get the ac fixed the next day mm -hmm. and not only that but um and the tenants did a lot of meticulous work on this because I'm not a math person, so I wouldn't have been able to do this. But they were they calculated roughly like what they were paying above and beyond what they would have if they were had a if they had a functioning mm -hmm. AC because the thing is still running the whole time. Right, obviously, yeah. it's just not pumping out cool air. Um, and they asked like, "Can we ask for his money?" It's like, "We can sure as fuck try." Yeah. And uh, we we squabbled over the details a bit with the landlord, but eventually we were able to agree on like two thousand dollars in excess electrical fees, and they wow. sat and wrote a check right then wow. and there. And that's not something that's like within the law. Like True. landlords yeah. don't have to do that by any stretch of the imagination. But I mean, I think um, you know they're a very scared, and b you know we have a decent enough platform at this point where we can bring some bad. Yeah. press to landlords too as a threat Absolutely. as well and so i think um i think you can definitely overshoot your demands and you should always overshoot because you want to have something to bargain mm -hmm. down mm -hmm. to the the money back is um always going to be more difficult landlords aren't going to be willing to do that but if you're if you're asking for that on top of like the immediate repairs that need to be made it gives you more negotiating mm -hmm. power to be able to like get down to just make these fucking repairs dude, at the end of the yeah. day. Yeah, I don't think we've ever told someone like, oh, actually, the law doesn't say you get to ask for yeah. that. You know, we ask <laughs> yeah. people what's going to make you feel whole, what's going to make you feel like this is a mm. justified situation after you've been wronged, and we sort of give them advice on how that might go. That's a good approach, yeah. Mm -hmm. What can make you feel whole about the situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but yeah, like, um, you know, even going in like, the early days of OTU, getting one person's deposit back, getting one family's repair done quickly impacts a person's life. And that in and of itself is a real service to, to another human being. Um, and you can do that relatively quickly. And then I, I assume just some basic knowledge of probably even a small amount of law of your local area about, you know, what are the basic tenants' rights here? And if you could just cite to a landlord this specific law, you know, on the books, that in and of itself can be powerful in getting something done or fixed. Like you are required by law to do that. Like, oh, these people aren't just random people who are upset about something. They've looked into this, yeah. and that gives you an mm -hmm. air of, of seriousness that the that the landlord can't exactly. deny. Exactly, and we do a lot of creative interpretations of yeah. the law too. That like yeah. I don't know would necessarily. I, I, I know landlords are listening to this, so <laughs> <Absolutely I'll, not. laughs> uh, you know that probably wouldn't hold up in court, uh, or you know they could if the if the court was doing what it's like nominally supposed to do, mm -hmm. but uh, definitely in practice wouldn't. Um, but. I think, you know, like you said, just putting like a well articulated, it. asserting it confidently um, can really shake landlords <laughs> up and get them to grant some concessions that they might not otherwise. And I think it can also change like how the law is interpreted by landlords when they're doing their job, you know, doing their sort of landlording things. Like you mentioned earlier, like it's it is great to give a single person a deposit back or help a single person get their AC back on. But we also believe that that has an impact on how landlords operate going forward because of the facts that we were talking about earlier about how networked that they are and how much they communicate, right? Them knowing that there is a fighting force that's bringing tenants together mm -hmm. is, uh, affects their actions. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, my friends. Well, where can listeners find and support Omaha Tenants United online? We have a website, uh, omahatennisunited.org. Um, on there, I think you can find, like, a uh, donate page. That's the easiest way to give and support, like, uh, just some of the small costs we have, like reserving meeting places, paying for printing, paying for food for tenant meetings, things like that. Um, 
most of our like actual sort of publication like write ups on things we've been doing is on Facebook. <laughs> so same thing, uh, Omaha Tennis United. If you Google, it should come up pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, we have some longer form or medium form writing on the like organizing we've been doing. If you have a tough time, I think kind of following like the sort of step by step we laid out like audio, through audio, we have written up some of that stuff um, as well. Cool. Uh, yeah. But we'd so love to do more resources actually. for other people and a chance to support even a small amount of money goes a long way because your overhead costs are not very high. Mm-hmm. So if anybody has disposable income and they like what they hear and they want to help this effort, donating a reasonable, a relatively small amount could really help you know, things for a long time. So consider that if, if you're one of those people. Yeah. And we've also gotten a lot from the autonomous tennis union network. Um, and I think that the member unions there, uh, if you kind of go to their website, will have some basic tenant organized resources that uh you know we haven't like put together those resources quite as well for people like just go and download a pdf like here's how to kind of do this thing Mm -hmm. if you're looking for those um i would just check that out and then find those unions um and then dsa's housing justice commission has done a good job of supporting people and starting new unions as well sweet all right my friends well thank you for the work you do locally and thank you for coming in and sharing that with us today keep up the good fight